any part of my life that I need to adjust while I still have time. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, I've gone on long enough, so I'm going to just conclude with a reference to one other biblical text here uh, on a somewhat happier note. It's not on the screen, uh, <clears throat> but it's found in Genesis 15 when God says to Abraham, it's part of the uh, God's call to Abraham, it says, Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. God was saying, I'm your ultimate protection. I'm your shield. And God did shield uh, Abraham for many years through many dangerous situations. So let me just suggest that as people of faith, we can look at God as our COVID-19 shield. Our COVID-19 shield. Our strong defender. And perhaps uh, one of your favorite hymns, uh, one of my favorite hymns is the shield, the breastplate of St. Patrick. Where St. Patrick said, I bind unto myself the, the name of the Trinity. Okay. Christ within me, Christ before me, Christ beside me. Okay. Christ to defend and to restore me. So we, we see images of uh, people in uh, surgical gowns, protective shields, and uh, that's good. That's very necessary. And we need to keep washing our hands and maybe wearing our mask, but also we can bind unto ourselves the shield of faith, the strong name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, that's, that's it here. And I think we have a few minutes for... Uh, some Q&A or, or comments. Great, thank you, Jack. Um, so uh, th those of you who've been before know the drill. Uh, if um, uh, you'd like to ask a question, uh, you will, if you take your cursor over your Zoom screen, you should see a little button down at the bottom of your screen that says, raise hand. And um, so if you'd like to ask a question at this point, you can raise your little blue hand and uh, I'll do my best to get to you. Bill? Jack, uh, thank you for this teaching. I, Bill, thank you. <laughs> good, to, good to hear you. <laughs> and, and through the, the uh, internet, happy Mother's Day to, to Robin in Virginia. Um, so I thank, thank you for thinking about COVID as a call to, to trust in God. Um, and I, I've been wondering about how to think about COVID in relation to past periods in which various catastrophes uh, of uncertain origin were the norm. Um, earthquakes, um, volcanic eruptions, pandemics, how do we think about this in relation to um, the, the last hundred years in which we really haven't had a pandemic on this scale um, versus the, the longer um, human history in which terrible crises were pretty much normal? And how do we think about our faith today um, relative to um, that longer span of, of human history and the ways in which God has called to us. Boy, that, that's a uh, very good question, uh, Bill. And uh, yeah, looking at uh, you know, COVID-19 and this particular plague in the long uh, arc of history, uh, it's both like some things in the past, and yet we are generally speaking in a different uh, situation. You know, for for most of human history, for most of human history, and for perhaps the majority of people who've ever lived on uh, the planet, uh, sort of the, the famously quoted words of uh, 
Thomas Hobbes, a, a skeptical philosopher of the Enlightenment, who famously said, uh, the state of man in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. And uh, even in the time of Martin Luther, uh, your, your odds of living uh, beyond uh, adolescence into adulthood were less than 50%. And you know, as you know, uh, infant mortality was very high in the, in the ancient world. And uh, before the 19th century and the control of many infectious diseases, you know, your chances of dying of an infectious disease uh, were extremely high. And you generally did not uh, live long enough in order to uh, die of, of a lot of the diseases that uh, degenerative diseases, you know, heart disease and cancer here that are the big killers in uh, many uh, modern societies. But, you know, it seems that, uh, you know, I, I've thought about this in that, uh, in a way, if, if we never had to die, if we were created to be immortal, uh, just naturally immortal, biologically immortal, we could forever postpone the big question of uh, our relationship to God. Uh, as a matter of fact, we wouldn't even have to think about that. So in a way, I think God has, uh, you know, used mortality and death and, and plague and natural disasters and so forth uh, to use uh, a phrase of uh, C.S. Lewis, oftentimes pain and suffering is God's megaphone to get our attention. And I think through no merits of our own, we as modern people, you know, living since the 19th century in the, in the era of modern medicine have been spared uh, mercifully of a lot of the suffering. I mean, it's a, it was a terrible thing to die of the Spanish flu. And uh, it's a terrible thing to die of COVID-19. Uh, and yet our chances are much better today. So uh, I would not want to go back to a pre-modern era. I'm thankful for modern medicine. You know, I'm thankful for modern science and technology. And uh, among the many people we should be praying for, not only the victims and the caregivers, but also we need to be praying for the scientists who even as we speak are eagerly searching for a vaccine against COVID-19. So um, I'm not sure I've really addressed your question here, but uh, you know, human mortality and suffering is sort of built into the human condition as we know it. And Jesus says, well, look, uh, be prepared to meet your maker at uh, any time because God does not guarantee you the lifespan for which you may be wishing. I guess I'm wondering, when we see posters and t-shirts that say, in Fauci we trust, are we being nudged to just question whether we have come to trust too much in a technical fix? Uh, yeah, per perhaps so. I think there, there are two things. I think there are different levels of trust. You know, uh, at the ultimate level, uh, I think God is our only hope. And uh, with, our, with our backs to the wall, uh, you know, I'm sort of driven to Romans 8, and, uh, you know, Paul's faith, Paul's trust that uh, there is nothing in all of God's creation, whether the unfallen creation or fallen creation, that ultimately, you know, whether it's uh, COVID-19, a plane crash, cancer, or, or whatever it is, is going to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is my ultimate hope and my ultimate trust. Uh, but then there are secondary levels of trust, Okay. And in terms of which human leaders or human experts I trust, and of course, I think we see the debate that's playing out in our society today as well, uh, which politician do I trust? Uh, which governor do I trust? And I must say that I have a relatively strong level of trust in the governor of Massachusetts at this point, Charlie Baker. In my opinion, I think he's doing a good job. But you know, which experts do you trust? Okay, and I, uh, I think trust Dr. Fauci, you know, more than some other uh, sources you might find on the internet. And uh, 
in terms of how to the, those complex questions of how policymakers and governors should balance, you know, the trade-off between saving lives and saving jobs, you know, that's a that's a tough one. But I think that uh, as as Christians, uh, our ultimate trust must be in God, no matter how long or short our lifespans are. Uh, but then we need to use good sense and good judgment to say that, well, what authorities, what leaders are worthy of our trust in terms of their knowledge, their character, their expertise, you know, and, and so forth. So uh, does, that, uh, does that connect Bill with? Thanks. Uh, maybe it's an unanswerable question, Jack. <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much. Okay, good to hear from you, Bill. Nice to hear your voice. Thanks, Bill. Susan? It's, like it's actually Jack. Oh, Jack. Good oh, morning, Jack. Yes, right. Well, like. Gray, uh, Father Gray, I wonder if you are aware that the background you're using or whatever is happening with lighting, uh, when we first tuned in, you were all gray on top, just like your name. <laughs> I thought, my God, this has really taken its toll on Father Gray. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think I'm backlit, so you actually can't yeah. see the light. Uh, so it's oh, the light. Okay. It's I was actually going for a halo effect, and oh, it, really? It didn't work. It, 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 it's total failure. Yeah. No, no, Father Patrick has become Pentecostal. Those are tongues of fire. There. Yes, that's right. Right behind his head. <laughs> At least I can. I'll lean on that one. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, in any case, um, I was going to mention Jack. Thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Um, You're and I wanted to respond um, to Bill Cross's uh, question and to to Jack, um, I wonder if you, a, a former student recently made a book suggestion to me that I've just begun, so I, I have not completed the book, but it's a fascinating book called The Year of Our Lord, 1943. Do you know this book? No, that's, that's a brand new, uh, I haven't heard about that, Jack. The, the author's last name is Jacobs. I can't remember the first name. The point is that it is an examination of the thoughts and uh, philosophical, uh, what should I say, searchings of W.H. Auden, C.S. Lewis, uh, T.S. Eliot, hmm. in, in how they were kind to, coming to grips with the question of their attitude toward um, the war, the Second World War. Ah, because in 43, as you know, it was not at all clear whether the Allies would prevail. Right. And yeah. so this is an examination of, of their struggle to come to terms as Christian humanists um, with that question. I've just begun it. I'm finding it fascinating, but I thought I'd share that with uh, you well, and Bill. Thank you for that reference. I wasn't familiar with that, but, uh, and Jack, you know, as you know, the sort of the larger issue in the background that I didn't really hit square on here is technical, it's, it's the theodicy question. Yeah, and it's you know the so-called the problem of evil uh, that philosophers and theologians have wrestled with and continue to wrestle with, and uh, the the classic statement. This this was you know formulated in its in its modern form after the uh, Great Lisbon earthquake in the 1750s, and uh, skeptical philosophers like Voltaire said, "Well, where where is your Christian God uh, in all of this? Uh, if God is all good." wouldn't he uh, prevent this disaster? Or if he was all powerful, uh, couldn't he do it? So uh, your Christian God uh, is uh, either not all good or not all powerful. And you know, one can raise similar questions uh, about the current uh, pandemic and uh, you know, related questions too about, you know, it, it seems that the people who are the most vulnerable, you know, poor, you know, minorities, uh, are the ones who are getting uh, hit the hardest. So yeah. issues of divine justice are really on the table here. Uh, and th those are hard questions. Thanks, Jack. Jack, just a side comment. That's Alan Jacobs who wrote that book. Um, Thank you. Do you and, know the book, Patrick? Oh, Alan Jacobs. Uh, I have, no, but uh, Amazon is, you know, quick to 
uh, tell you what it's oh. about. <laughs> uh, Alan Jacobs, the right. Good. Yeah, He's written a number of books um, uh, from a literary perspective and has a book on C.S. Lewis uh, and also has a, a, a kind of a history commentary of the Book of Common Prayer, actually, as well. Oh. Yeah, used right. to teach at Wheaton College, and I think Amazon said he's in Waco, Texas now. Okay, right. I have heard of Alan Jacobs, and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, one you know one thing that has surfaced during this whole discussion, a lot of commentators have pointed out that well, the 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 flaws in our current healthcare system, the lack of uh, health insurance that many people have or are currently using, losing. And the fact that, of course, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, and poor people in general are getting a uh, harder hit here raise questions about the the current justice of our medical care system. And the question is there: Well, uh, will we remember any of this if and when it's over? Yep. Uh, and that's an open question. Sure. Or again, as Dorothy pointed out in previous weeks here, uh, the environment is actually better uh, with less traffic on the streets. Yeah, but will we remember that good effect after it's all over? Probably not. So uh, what are we supposed to learn? Uh, what am I supposed to learn? And will I remember uh, any of this after it's over? Th those are uncomfortable questions, perhaps. Well, people in my parents' generation, um, it was very clear to me in, in my own parents' case and friends of theirs and so forth, that they remembered lots of things about the Great Depression and the Second World War. And I mean, little things when, you know, after my parents had died and we were settling up various things with the house, um, you know, we found uh, in my mother's uh, sort of uh, laundry cupboards, um, 200 and some laundry scoops, you know, the kinds of things they put in, in laundry detergent when you use the powdered form. You could had a, a scoop that would measure the right amount. She saved all those scoops. I mean, for no particularly good reason, obviously, but it was this depression mentality. You don't throw yes. anything away. <laughs> right, right. So will this have the psychic impact on us? Uh, I know. That will, well, time, time will tell. Uh, I've been asked the question, uh, forget by whom, that uh, do you think that uh, people's interest in religion or, or the Christian faith will take a bump upward as a result of what's going on? Uh, I, I've heard uh, anecdotal reports that sales of Bibles are up. And uh, in recent months, uh, Bible sales are up 30%. Now, whether that will last, uh, uh, beyond the end of May, uh, I do not know. But again, if, uh, if the book of Amos is any uh, indication, uh, pain and suffering uh, do not necessarily lead to revival. Uh, we can still miss the point. And uh, so what time will tell. So I'm not uh, betting on revival in the short term. <laughs> Thank you. Got another question here. Becky? Oh, there's Becky. Hi, Becky. See, Becky, I can unmute you if I... Uh, okay, I see how it works. There you <laughs> go. This is actually a question from David. Ah, David. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Jack, so much for shedding the light of biblical wisdom on these distressing current events, and I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, you, you've certainly uh, been able to draw out important Old and New Testament teaching about the correlation between uh, natural disasters and uh, other such potential judgments of God on situations in which there is rampant injustice and the society is heading in the wrong direction and so on. And that clearly is an important strain of biblical teaching. But there's another strain too that has to be perhaps also acknowledged. Uh, it comes out in the book of Job, big time. It also comes out in the New Testament and that is a certain skepticism or at very least reluctance to make a definite correlation between sin and suffering. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, am I suffering or is our society suffering because we've sinned or, you know, Job was a righteous man. I mean, that comes out clearly and his false comforters were the ones who were ringing the changes on, uh, well, you must have sinned at some point because God would not be visiting all these, you know, plagues and, uh, and deaths and uh, destruction upon you. So, you know, frequently we have to balance various strains of biblical teaching that kind of, uh, one keeps us from going too far in the other direction, et cetera. So would you have a comment on, on that aspect of biblical teaching? I remember, for instance, in, in one pericope, Jesus, uh, you know, responds to the question, uh, who, who sinned, this man or his parents? And mm -hmm. so, I, eh, you know, let's, let's not make too definite a correspondence here between sin and suffering. So that guess, I guess raises the question, are we suffering yeah. now because wow. of injustices? Maybe we are. Uh, divinely ordained suffering, or, or, or maybe we, we also need to be a little perhaps judiciously skeptical about that equation. No, that's, that's exactly right, David. I think you're uh right on to point to Job as you might say the other, the rest of the story in terms of the theodicy or justice of God uh, uh, question. And uh, yeah, because I, I think both the book of Job and then of course Jesus's comments uh, in Luke 13 to which I alluded there say, well, look, don't, don't be too quick to make a point by point or one-to-one -one correlation between a particular individual's suffering and their sin or lack of sin, that that connection may or may not exist. Uh, each one of us, just individual before God, would say, well, is there a message for me that I need to pay attention to? Uh, years ago, uh, I wrote a little article uh, in which uh, I was reflecting on the Holocaust, and of course, that's the hardest, uh, the hardest one. And there uh, suggested a reading of scripture in which there is both uh, principles of regularity and predictability in the world. You know, God makes a covenant with creation. God makes a covenant with Israel, with the church and so forth. So there is a basis for some regularity, but we also find in human experience and also in texts uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter nine, where the writer says, time and chance happen to them all. Mm -hmm. And I argued from that, that God has built uh, into the structure of the world, not only principles of re re regularity, but uh, principles that appear to be us uh, totally random. Uh, you can't figure them out. Uh, they, they stuff, you know, stuff uh, happens. And oftentimes the good die young and the wicked live long lives and, uh, you know, die at a ripe old age. Life doesn't make sense. And uh, as I reflected on that, I said, well, I think God deliberately builds a principle of sort of randomness and chaos into the world so that uh, there's not a simple formula that God gives to us, do these 10 things and you will never suffer. Mm -hmm. Your children will never rebel. You will never die of cancer. You will never get COVID-19. Do these 10 things and you've got it made, see? And if that were the case, I would be tempted to, to uh, you know, love God simply when my life is good, rather than loving God for God's own sake. Mm -hmm. So will, will I continue to love God when things are bad? Or can I be, uh, be like Habakkuk and say, well, even when the fig tree doesn't blossom, I will rejoice in God because God is God and God is good. And I know that God, mm -hmm. uh, God is good. And I uh, actually years ago I had to preach a sermon, a funeral sermon uh, for Greg Hills, who's, who's still the pastor of First Presbyterian Church uh, in Ipswich, for his first wife. And uh, Greg and Gretchen Hills had been called to Turkey as missionaries to the Muslims. His wife contracted breast cancer. Mm. There was massive prayer for Gretchen's healing. Uh, by the church and by our friends. Uh, God did not answer that prayer in the way that we wanted. Gretchen died of cancer. Okay, what's going on here? But throughout it all, uh, Gretchen Hill said, well, 
I know that God is good. And whether he heals me or whether I die, uh, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. So, uh, you know, in, in, in the funeral sermon, I was able to say, well, yeah, Gretchen was an example in a random world where our prayers are often not answered, that she loved God for God's own sake. Thank you, Jack. Wonderful answer. Good to hear. Good to hear from you, David. Good to hear from you. Thank you, David and Becky. You're welcome. We have a couple more minutes if there's any other uh, questions at this point. Otherwise, we can move to coffee hour. Okay. Oh, oh there are some questions. Here we go. Okay. Father Dean. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Wow, this is wonderful, particularly starting with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think we have to go back to that a lot of times in these scriptures. Uh, I am uh, want to echo a little bit, I think, of what has been brought up just now, but that is I'm, I'm taking this uh, God sending plagues upon the city and the possibility of our saying God has sent COVID-19. It's his responsibility. He's a sovereign God who is uh, punishing us or humbling us uh, to my unbelieving, skeptical grandchildren, uh, to my siblings, to my close friends, to the, to the people of Christ Church I know who are struggling with faith uh, and, and to which such a message would be pushing them off and saying, my heart just can't accept this kind of a God. And so pointing back to Job and uh, the blind man in John that was referred to, I'd like to add the very, uh, words of uh, Christ in, uh, in Luke 13 that you've brought to us. And I think there, Jesus seems to be saying about the, uh, those slaughtered by uh, Pilate and uh, those killed in the Siloam, Jesus does seem to be saying what you just say, said, and I want to affirm that, that stuff happens. And whereas the ancients uh, the ancient prophets, uh, the, the writer in uh, Deuteronomy and, and the prophets could say more specifically to the people, God is sending this judgment uh, to kill off your people in battle and so forth. I think we today, through the lens of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the working of life, and uh, our whole cultural uh, progression are saying that uh, Jesus was saying there in Luke 13, yeah, those people died, not for their own fault. Yeah, this guy's blind, but not for his own fault. Or, uh, but stuff happens. And we're using stuff euphemistically, of course. Uh, stuff in this world does happen. And when pandemic comes along, I see it as coming from the source of all evil, the enemy, and God uses it, and God wants to use it for our discipline. God wants to use it for the judgment of, uh, of countries and nations. And, and so I guess I'm pleading for uh, a sense that uh, bad things are happening in this world from natural disasters and from worlds. And uh, to Bill Cross, I would say, look at what's happened in the last hundred years from our positions of privilege and comfort in the US, uh, maybe we can say that things haven't been that bad, but uh, in the 40s, the Holocaust, Stalin, uh, the refugees today, the pandemics in Africa, and uh, the, the condition of the poor, and the reason migrants are fleeing from Latin America to our borders, uh, terrible, terrible things are happening around the world right now. And I don't, want, I, I don't want to be giving people the impression that all these terrible things happening are the judgments of God, but that there's a God of love that allows national uh, determination, cultural free will, and individual free will to respond to him through the terrible tragedies of this life. And I think that's what you, you have been getting at. But I want to just re-emphasize that, that there is uh, the basic heart of God is his hesed, his loving, compassionate love, and his sense of justice. 
and uh, evil will be punished, but that the enemy, uh, our enemy, the accuser, the deceiver, the one who plagued for humankind from the beginning, uh, is the ultimate author of COVID-19. And God chooses, and Christ wants that terrible suffering to humble us and to bring unbelievers back to himself. And I just don't want my grandsons and daughters to be put off by hearing from us that uh, now this is a punishment because we've been bad, but that there's a loving God who wants to overcome evil and through his mercy and grace revealed in Jesus Christ, bring us back to his loving arms. Sorry for the little preachment there, Jack. <laughs> no, th thanks, Dean. No, I, I agree with what you're saying. That's a good word. And I think that I will uh, affirm that and take that as a happy uh, conclusion to this part of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. I know there's a couple of other questions in our, our chat, but maybe, uh, uh, Jack, it may be at best uh, to do those offline at this point. Does that sound good to you? That's fine. Okay. So sorry for you folks who still have some uh, your blue hands raised, um, but uh, uh, Jack would Jack. I don't know if you want to type in your email address uh, in the chat so that some if anyone wants to follow up with you about uh, something you said, uh, you're welcome to to do that. Okay. I'll, yeah. Great. Well, at this time, um, I'd like to uh, welcome folks into coffee hour. So uh, if uh, I'm going to lower everyone's blue hand at this point. Uh, but if you uh, would like to come to coffee hour, if you could raise your blue hand at this point, and I will be happy to invite you in uh, at this time to coffee hour. It's a little different than what we used to do. But I think we've got, a, we've got the hang of it now. And you know, um, Jack, I, uh, I've been... Um, uh, you always end the the speaker always ends up in the, the top left corner of my screen, so I I end up starting our coffee hour conversation uh, with the uh, with the with the speaker, and uh, you know today's uh, fruit of the spirit um, is uh, uh, goodness, which is often also uh, uh, translated as generosity, mm. and um, I didn't know if you wanted to. Uh, give us a, 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 a thought about uh, how you've seen goodness, maybe God's goodness, God's generosity uh, uh, manifested in your life or in someone else's life recently. Um, uh, it is also Mother's Day, as we have noted, and there's certainly uh, resonance there with uh, goodness and generosity, but I uh, wondered if, or you could just uh, ignore that altogether and just tell us how you're doing. So, uh, um, but wondered if you want to get the ball rolling for us here at, at coffee hour. Sure, thank you. No, I, I think I, and I'm sure so many of us have been uh, just amazed by the generosity of so many, you know, frontline caregivers who are putting their lives at risk, you know, to, uh, you know, care for people and, uh, you know, doing it, uh, their duty uh, cheerfully and unselfishly. So I think that's, uh, uh, you know, a great example of generosity. And uh, I, I sometimes, you know, I've talked about the problem of evil, uh, but there's also, I think, uh, from my point of view, uh, it you might say the problem of good. Uh, given how bad the world can be, uh, I must say I don't deserve uh, the degree of goodness uh, and comfort that I've been allowed to enjoy. So I'm very thankful for that. And especially for, for family members and so forth. So I'll pass the, the microphone on now. All right, thanks, Jack. And thank you for your, taking time for your, uh, giving us your presentation. We my really pleasure. Jack and Susan, I've got you next on my screen. Can you hear me now? Yes. I've said that I'm seated next to good. Oh, shoot. <laughs> what is wrong with Some, it? Stop it. Somebody is sharing a screen. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. okay. Anyway, I was saying that I'm seated next to goodness. That's but three times. I, I couldn't agree more <laughs> with Jack Davis when he talks about the generosity of healthcare workers and, I mean, and I, at every level. It is just remarkable to me. And a, I, you know, I don't quite know what an appropriate way to express the gratitude to those people. I fortunately haven't needed their services much at all. But um, it, is, it is just overwhelming, the generosity that they represent. Yes, we uh, had a phone call from our friend Ann Jones, who's uh, the, uh, the wife of the now deceased uh, Bishop of Indianapolis, who's just a, a wonderful person. And, uh, you know, she, she uh, lets the conversation get, uh, you know, uh, she never lets it get negative. And uh, she was talking about uh, the things that she's uh, decided she can do. And uh, they were wonderful examples of generosity and goodness. And, uh, you know, it's clear that it helps her as well as anybody else who's surprised by, you know, um, an envelope full of cash from her, um, from her stimulus check. Uh, or uh, a loaf of bread or something. Uh, a loaf of bread goes a long way. So uh, I'm always happy to learn from Anne. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that could do it for us. And we're always happy to learn from you, Mother Susan. <laughs> How <And> kind. <laughs> thank you for, for your prayers uh, this morning. And Jack, thanks for your musical offering as always. So that was great. Uh, Posey, I've got you next on my screen. Morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you, Posey. Thank you. Uh, you think about, you know, comfort the needy, feed the poor, all the food banks, the generosity of all the food banks, the people who are offering free food, free food, the uh, farmers that are donating all the, all the extra milk instead of pouring it out. Uh, the generosity and goodness of all the all the frontline workers, the uh, you know the, the nurses, the doctors, people who have stepped up that that uh, you know didn't have to, people who have traveled to New York, nurses that have traveled to New York uh, to help out during this pandemic. There's been so much generosity and goodness uh, that's come out of this, and I think of the generosity of our of our Christchurch family. Uh, the presentations, Jack, that was wonderful today, and. You know, just the the hope that that is generated by by our Christ Church family and the 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 generosity of uh, of sharing sharing our prayers and sharing our our worship time uh, with Patrick and and uh, our church leaders Jack and and Dean and Susan. Uh, I think of I think of all the generosity and the goodness in the, in our Christ Church leaders, and um, so appreciative of that. I see generosity and, and, and an increase in faith amongst people who may not have otherwise turned to their faith and turned to the church. And I think, uh, Jack, you're right, the, uh, you know, the increase in the number of Bibles sold, 30% increase, it speaks to that, that, uh, that people are turning to their faith, they are turning to God, maybe not for answers, but for comfort and healing you know, and strength. And I think that's, that's where people are turning and the, the generosity, the generosity of our Lord God and, and, and his savior, Jesus Christ, that generosity and goodness. And I know in your sermon, Patrick, you talked about, you know, good, good teacher, uh, when, when the, uh, when the, uh, the, the, the disciple kneels in front of Jesus and calls him good teacher. And the only good goodness is God. He's good God. You know, I think we have to appreciate that and, and pray for that and thank God for that. So that's where I see generosity and goodness. That's great, Posey. Well, we see generosity and goodness in you too. So we're very thankful for that. It's like a mutual admiration society here. So, uh, thank <laughs> so thank, thank you, Posey. Thank you. Uh, Ryan and Carolyn, I got you next on my screen. Hey. Hi, everybody. Hi, nice to see everyone. Um, you know, as a, someone who works in the philanthropic sector, you know, I, I get to see incredible generosity all the time, but I think it, in this moment, um, it's, it's really striking, um, families, uh, foundations that 
are not only continuing commitments, but are accelerating commitments uh, to different nonprofits. And it's, um, you know, I've seen some of that, you know, at International Justice Mission where I work, um, but also other, uh, other similar uh, organizations. And that's, that to me is just really exciting. I think knowing um, how important uh, nonprofits and churches are to, uh, you know, caring for people here in our country and around the globe. And um, that's, that's just been really, really encouraging. Um, I, because of international justice missions, global work, uh, partnering with law enforcement to, um, to strengthen justice systems, I've seen, uh, you know, firsthand stories of uh, men and women who are in police forces in places like India and the Philippines who are working uh, with support from IJM, but to protect the rights of the poor and the vulnerable. And I think that that generosity of, of spirit in, in a time where people are scared and afraid and um, arguably, uh, you know, the poor are more vulnerable, both economically, but also because of the surge of violence that's often happening. Um, so it's just neat. It's neat to see those things, um, even in the midst of all the things that we mourn right now. So. Yeah, I guess I'd echo that um, in my work and with um, watching even what's happening with the schools. And I mean, we had a meeting with Vivian's, one of her primary teachers, who was in tears this week, wanting to do more for the kit for the students. I think the generosity of spirit and um, you know, people in their daily work and teachers in particular sort of doing a full 180 and, you know, changing the way they do everything in order to continue serving students, um, which is, I think, very taxing and draining um, for them, but, uh, but they're doing it with so much passion. Um, and that is very, very meaningful, um, at least to me as a parent, um, to know that Vivian's teachers care for her in that way. So, um, yeah, seeing, seeing a, an outpouring of creativity and dogged commitment to serving one another um, in the midst of all of this is encouraging. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Hopefully you're celebrating in some way. <laughs> and happy Mother's Day to you, Carolyn. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Nancy, I've got you next on my screen here. Hi, um, hi everybody. Um, that was just um, a really, really um, uh, profitable uh, presentation, Jack. So I, I want to thank you for that um, and all the, the comments that came from that. <laughs> came from that. Um, it made me appreciate even more how much I value um, civil discourse and exchanging of ideas and, and how much it enriches me. Um, as for the, the kindness, Oh, I, I just have a, a burning question for Father Patrick. I just was wondering if you are still doing Vinyl Fridays. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm not in my office a whole lot, so that's, that's where my record right. right. player is. So, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so okay. I'm not doing much with Vinyl Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or any day. Right okay, now. okay. So, <laughs> just, just had to know, absolutely had to know. Okay. Um, I do like Vinyl, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, for the for the kindness, I I just see so many. Um, well, like two two weeks ago, you know, I had to go over to Target to get the last jar of baking powder. You know, um, I had to order it online with a credit card, which is totally absurd, but I did. And and the young man who.